Almighty Father, send your Holy Spirit upon us this evening, filling us with your joy and gladness that we may then strengthen each other in goodwill and charity and inspire each other with genuine hope. But Father, tonight we also know that there are many who oppose us, who even hate us. Grant us the grace to stand against them and triumph over them, if it be your holy will. All the while bearing in mind the admonishment of your Son, Jesus. Love your enemies, bless those who persecute you. Lord, bless, Lord, let us never lose our hearts to false messiahs who promise salvation through the sacrifice of freedom. Let us never believe in any change that runs contrary to the laws of nature and nature's God. May we remember that it was you, Lord, not any government or party, who created all men equal, male, female, black, white, born, and unborn. May we place our hope and trust in you alone. Most Holy Trinity, bless the mothers of unborn babies, the babies in their wombs, and the mothers who have aborted their babies. Bless your church, our nation, and our president. Bless the Brent Society, and bless Miss Nellie Gray. And bless also all of our enemies. And bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, please join with me in uh, saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> if you would all join me. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulce Do, Et Spes Nostra Salve. Ate clamamos, Exules Filii Have. Spiramus, Gementes et Flentes, in hoc lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, illos tuos, misericordes oculos, ad nos convete. Et Jesu, benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium ostende. O clemens, o pia, Um, I have a, there's a few people that I want to make a special note of to welcome. Um,
practiced his Catholicism in Virginia from Kim, King James II, and the Brents led the efforts to build a Catholic church, which was the president, pre predecessor of Old St. Mary's in Alexandria, which our moderator father sells a station now, and a vibrant Catholic community that I'm happy to report continues today in Northern Virginia. Um, the history of the society and a, um, uh, um, an application to join are, are on your seats, and if you don't have one, we're happy to provide one for you if you're interested, and um, take some to give to your friends and family. Um, with that uh, background, the, um, the Bishop Welsh Distinguished Service Award um, is um, named after our founder, Bishop Thomas Welsh, the first, diocese, first bishop of the Arlington Diocese. Um, the Brent Society was established in 1975. And we've had a number of truly distinguished award winners since the first award was given out in 1975. Um, and our, our uh, recipient today um, certainly fits into that category. Um, I would like to now introduce to you Dr. Brian Close, who is the Director of Research at Human Life International, who will introduce our honored guest. Brian? Good evening, everybody. I represent Human Life International, which is the world's largest pro-life and pro-family organization. We have branches in 88 countries now. We were founded way back in 1972 by Father Paul Marx, OSB, who was called the Apostle of Life by Pope John Paul II. He was once introduced by a nervous moderator as Father Karl Marx, SOB. <laughs> <laughs> In all those years, we've traveled about six million miles to 150 different countries. And among our accomplishments is slowing down, stopping, or reversing the legalization of abortion in more than 20 countries. Now, I've traveled about a million miles myself, and I've seen many different things. And I can tell you right now that the National March for Life is more like the International March for Life. The pro-abortionists have one thing right when they say, as the American pro-life movement goes, so goes the world pro-life movement. We've had marches for life in more than 30 countries, including Canada, France, Italy, Germany, Austria, Poland, the Czech Republic, Trinidad, and the Philippines. When I was at the 2000 Bombay March in India, there were over 5,000 people there, led by 12 bishops in 100 degrees sweltering heat in full regalia. So you know they took this very seriously indeed. Now, a lot of people I've talked to refer to Ms. Nelly as the most persistent and tenacious pro-life person they know. The first National March for Life was way back in 1974 and 20,000 people showed up to be on the west steps of the Capitol. It was 70 degrees and sunny that year. I think our Lord was trying to encourage us, but I don't think we've had weather like that ever since then. Since that time, she has planned and directed 35 more marches, attended by a total of more than 6 million people. Now that is the largest continuous protest march of any kind in the world, over 36 years. We all know how the press slobbers over the pro-abortion people when they have their marches for death every once in a while, but they have theirs in June, and they barely get the numbers we do. If they had to march in January with all the lousy weather and the wind and the snow and the cold, they could probably drive there in one of these new smart cars you see around here every once in a while. <laughs> I think one of the greatest things about the national pro-life movement, the National March for Life here, and also the International March for Life, is it brings so many people into the pro-life movement. Every year, thousands upon thousands of people show up, and they're a little nervous and unsure because they don't know what to expect. It's the first thing they've ever done pro-life. 
But then they see hundreds of thousands of people, all the diversity, all the priests and religious sisters there. They see the young people, they see the enthusiasm, and it infects them with a kind of drive to go back to their home parishes and home states and get involved. So how many hundreds of thousands of babies have been saved because these people first came to the March for Life, saw the beauty and the power of the pro-life movement, and went back home and started working the pro-life movement. Miss Nelly is definitely suited for running this huge event, one that endures such lousy weather, media indifference, and sometimes even criticism from the pro-life movement itself. Uh, she was in the Women's Army Corps during World War II, so she has a military organizational background, and she's got degrees in business administration, economics, and law, which makes a perfect background indeed to run something like this. She describes herself as a solitary person, and I can attest to that because in the dozen or two times I've called her up, she answers the phone personally herself every time. She is a member of the greatest generation, not only of this country, but of the pro-life movement, the people who actually began the pro-life movement in the United States and then spread it all over the world. And I'd like to read a little bit of praise for her for some of the other members of the first generation of pro-life champions. And Mrs. Judy Brown founded the American Life League 30 years ago. ALL describes itself as pro-life without exception, without compromise, without apology. Mrs. Brown says that Nellie Gray first inspired me to defend the personhood of the preborn child when she spoke the evening before the March for Life in 1976. She was totally correct in her position then and still is today. May God bless her for all the good work she's done for his babies. Dr. Jack Wilkie was involved with the National Right to Life Committee right from the start back in 1973. He says, Barbara and I have known Nellie during this whole controversy. She was standing alongside of us from the very beginning. Her position has been one of pro-life with no exception and no compromises. While ours has at times been more pragmatic politically, that is not in the least lessen our admiration, love, and respect for her. She will go down in history as one of the major players in the pro-life movement in the USA in the 20th and 21st century. We're all getting on in years now, and perhaps our time left is short, but one thing that will live on will be the memory of her remarkable contributions to the cause of the unborn. Professor Charles Rice, the great champion of life and orthodoxy at the formerly great University of Notre Dame, <laughs> says that Nellie Gray is a highly competent lawyer whose advice I have relied upon numerous occasions, but she's more. She's a fighter for the culture of life whose persistent dedication continues to be an inspiration to all of us. She has earned our abundant appreciation. Father Paul Marks, the founder of Human Life International, has been in the pro-life movement for more than half a century now. He was one of the very first people to see the approaching abortion storm. He says Miss Nelly is quite a gal and very faithful to the pro-life cause, which is a lot to say for an old German priest. <laughs> Father Marx and Miss Nelly Gray are primarily responsible for spreading the pro-life movement all over the world. Father Marx through organization and Miss Nelly through inspiration. Only God knows how many hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of Nigerian, Panamanian, Filipino, Argentinian, and American babies have been saved, not only directly by them, but by the people they brought into the pro-life movement. But certainly, her most important contribution is the life principles, which say, this is a quote, there's no justification for the state or for anyone to intentionally kill an innocent human. No exceptions, no compromise. If we'd worked together under this principle from the very start, we wouldn't be in the horrible mess we are now. Things do look black. Things look very, very seriously awry in the United States and all over the world right now. But it isn't too late. It's never too late. We can still stop and even reverse the tide of death in the United States as we have in Eastern Europe and parts of Africa. One way to do this is to participate in and support the March for Life. So come out on January the 22nd and help support Miss Nelly. An even more important way is to instill the life principles in your own existences, in your own lives, and try to spread this to other people. We can stop the culture of death in its tracks by establishing the life principles in our lives. Only then will we see the ultimate goal of a pro-life nation and a pro-life world. 
But until that happens, until every single last baby is safe in Africa, in Latin America, all over Asia, Europe, Oceania and the United States and Canada, since every last, until every single last baby is safe, we're going to need people like Ms. Lely, Nellie Gray to lead the way. And so come on up, Ms. Nellie, and let's hear some inspirational words. of a celebration is for all of you too. You're the ones who are out there in the snow just as well as I am, you know. I do want to thank the Brent Society for this great honor of being with you and being, it's a, a wonderful evening also to be able to meet with you this evening, talk with you. I'm going to um, pick out a little bit out of that introduction about the Brent Society where they're talking about persecution. I said, uh, and I'm going to use the word persecution a couple of times tonight. Um, for myself, uh, also, in the era uh, that I uh, got into professional work and so forth, um, there weren't very many women in uh, law school, and there weren't very many uh, in the offices and so forth, and nobody seemed to mind. Uh, the men in the office didn't seem to pay any attention that there was another a, a woman in the office and two or three of us and so forth. But the one thing they did pay attention to was that I was a Roman Catholic. So when you think about the family, the Brent, having to come and leave one home, go to another, remember this persecution is here. It is still here for the babies and for the work that we're doing for Roe versus Wade. And so the persecution is here as someone says to you, you're a Roman Catholic, you're an educated woman. Why are you doing what all these people are telling you to do? And follow uh, someone telling you whether or not you can go to the movie and uh, when a movie's good for you and not good for you. And that seemed to bother everybody a great deal. Uh, it was a matter, obviously, of making up my own mind of whether or not I was going to the movie. But this persecution is here and it's something that we must deal with think about and know that we really must um, uh, uh, deal in terms of the kind of work that we have to do because it is extremely, extremely difficult and going to be um, uh, very much more. So tonight, as I say, I'm um, thinking about the situation where we are. Notre Dame has already been mentioned. Uh, I'll mention it again. And the thing is that we have to take a look at the few uh, incidents and current news uh, that's happening just in the, in the last few days, you know. And um, we'd like to mention such, uh, uh, such things as Roe v. Wade has been here for the 36 years, all right. Uh, what we know about is that Roe v. Wade means the intentional killing of innocent reborn boys and girls. And we have to keep this in mind as we're going along with the information this, uh, tonight. Keep in mind that an estimated 3,000 babies are intentionally killed every day in America. 3,000. When this administration gets up every morning, there are 3,000 babies probably killed in America today. And since Roe versus Raid, that number is 50 million. 50 million. That means that a whole group of people in ages 1 through 36, 50 million have been intentionally killed in our country. And much of it is the language that is being used. As Roe v. Wade began, the Supreme Court seemed to pin the life of all of those preborn children 
on the fact that the Supreme Court didn't know when life began. Uh, you know, as a Supreme Court, they do have something like the Library of Congress and so forth available for them, and they could find out exactly when life began. But unfortunately, they built Roe v. Wade on the misinformation they don't know when life begins. More has happened and everybody knows when life begins, and still we have, unfortunately, Roe v. Wade with us. I just wanted to point out some of the items that uh, have occurred in the last oh, week or two. Uh, recently things uh, uh, that set the stage for part of what we want to talk about tonight. What are we gonna do about this? Probably the first thing that comes to your mind, certainly comes to my mind, is there was an election in November. Many people were uh, really praying very much on the outcome of that election. Uh, my phone was ringing saying, we prayed um, and we have this candidate. Uh, our prayers weren't answered. And really what you need to say is, well, we have this candidate, now the President of the United States, uh, this is what we have. Our prayers were answered some way. Maybe we don't know exactly how and why and uh, what would be the outcome, but this is what we have. We also understand that incidents are happening that reflect our thoughts and how we're going to act. For instance, I guess one of the most important things that all of us are thinking about is that uh, immediately after the elections, it was well reported that 54% of Roman Catholics chose to vote for a candidate who openly admitted being very much in favor of so-called choice. Um, this is despite the fact that that candidate had said that as a candidate he would be president of all of the people. That meant all except some by choice he was not interested in. And yet he was going to uh, carry out the will of the people and be good for the country and the next thing you know he has been um, uh, installed as president and we have uh, now the Mexico City policy being discarded. We have the conscience clause being discarded which I guess of all the things that I think about most is that conscience clause. Uh, it it kind of reads to me something like uh, if someone does not want to perform a task because of conscience, the answer is you will either do that or uh, we'll take your license away from you. Uh, that's a um, rather difficult and important act for this administration. Next comes at least Notre Dame. Uh, the March for Life um, sent a statement into the Notre Dame asking that the invitation to the president we would be withdrawn, but the school did not choose to follow uh, that request of many, many people. And so we have a situation that is hitting into our very hearts. And I think that's what you see is that many of us are so deeply concerned about the invitation of uh, uh, this president to Notre Dame, seeing a feeling very comfortable that he would be able to make a speech at the end of which would be that uh, the issues were there and probably would not change, that the issues itself were irreconcilable, which means an intention for the preborn children, unfortunately, is not good. And then the last couple of days of a nominee for the Supreme Court. Phone rings on that too. What do you think about this? And I have really said, um, I, I'm not um, very much persuaded by some of the um, so-called personal experiences uh, because uh, we also have a, a report at least of this nominee saying um, such things that, uh, as uh, uh, it would be probably a better situation for 
the Latin, uh, uh, Latino woman to make a decision than white men under any circumstance that I can think of right now. A similar uh, statement uh, is not only racial, uh, but I would think that the nominee would immediately uh, be disqualified and asked to resign, uh, to be removed right then and there on a discrimination situation, but that is not happening. So what's our reaction to see these kinds of situations that we have in our community in America uh, right now? Most of us talk to one another, we shake our heads, we discuss the things, we say how bad it is, we may even pick up the phone and call somebody and say, I'm all concerned about this. Listen to what I just heard over the radio. So what are we going to, uh, uh, to do about this? Um, it's a matter of trying to assess these new items and see that the issue of abortion pops up now and then everywhere. But the pro-life efforts are not making as strong an impact as the feminist abortionists who are using language to try such as choice and privacy and single issue. And with that kind of language to uh, obscure the fact of killing 3,000 preborn children every day. And um, so therefore we're not getting our message out the issue of abortion keeps popping up and people have to deal with it, but we're not getting the message out as strongly as we should that 3,000 preborn children are killed every day. And I think here again, this shows up in that statistic of 54% of Roman Catholics uh, voting for a candidate who is uh, wanting to keep Roe versus Wade in place. Now, if we're going to do anything at all about this, it's a matter, we've got to come together. There are, in my judgment, the most important thing is unity. Unity. There isn't anybody around most of our, uh, the people in our families and around who do not want to save the babies. That issue, uh, when they get to thinking about it, Immediately, they, they don't want to be associated with intentionally killing the innocent preborn children. And um, so the whole strategy has got to be one of unity. How are we going to get unity? Uh, the simple thing is education, because mostly when you can get to talk to someone close enough to take a little bit of quiet time and say, do you understand what this really means, what Roe v. Uh, really means? Um, you see this kind of blank stare look of saying, it's almost like it's something out of sight, out of mind. And the feminist abortionists have been very, very good at keeping the issue of killing innocent preborn children out of sight and out of mind. It's a matter of education, as I say. A matter of educating everybody what is going on in America every day. Every day, 3,000 babies are killed. In order to educate and unify, you have to have a policy. You gotta know what you're doing. What are we going to lay forth uh, to bring us all together? And when we're talking about unity, we're not just talking about um, a unity of those of us who are in the legislative work or in um, uh, uh, trying to uh, promote a change of uh, Roe v. Wade and overcome Roe. We're talking about the pregnancy aid centers. Uh, we're talking about the churches. Everyone who is interested in the lives of the innocent preborn children. We are talking about those people, however they're associated in the pro-life uh, movement, that they must be unified. That's the only way we're going to be able to put this together. And so what policy are we talking about then? 
the policy has got to be one also that we can all believe in. Believe in with the strength of our hearts and our souls and our thinking and so forth. Something we can understand. In the beginning of the March for Life, um, and in, in fact, as uh, Brian was saying in the beginning when we were putting together the whole pro-life movement and the organizations and so forth, what uh, we were seeing were groups coming together from all of the states. We were uh, meeting together. We knew we wanted to stop the killing of the children. And there was still immediately, even then, uh, a discussion about what exactly will be the policy that we follow for pulling us all together. And unfortunately, uh, the, the policy was somewhat set up as uh, an exception clause. No abortions except to save the life of the mother. Sometime it would go, no abortions except to save the life of the mother, rape and incest. And why that? Because it was a feeling by many of the pro-life people of being compassionate. They did not understand there were principles that uh, assured that we did not have to have an exception clause in order to save the lives of every innocent human being. But the whole issue of an exception clause found its way within the full pro-life movement, as I say, sometimes on a matter of feeling compassionate for the mother, or it may have been looking at a political situation, looking at the Congress, uh, looking at the uh, Supreme Court, looking at the White House, and seeing that it was impossible, they thought, at that time, uh, to make persons understand uh, that the pro-life issue had to be won without an exception at all. If you're trying to stop the killing, you must stop the killing. And so, when the March for Life began, it was a group of people coming together, thinking about a march. Uh, my goodness, uh, at that time, we had just come out of the civil rights era here in Washington, D.C. Uh, many of the people uh, coming and being in uh, the parks where there was mud and slush and uh, carrying their banners and so forth and people thought about oh my goodness a march in Washington DC uh, nobody was really very much interested in that a few it wasn't I by the way a few people uh, I mean I, I I was not part of the be exact beginning of this uh, a few people saw the need for a march for life because they had already experienced abortion in their states and particularly in the state of New York. And they already went through uh, having abortion uh, declared uh, all right in the state of New York and, um, and then they had overturned that law but their overturning was vetoed. And so they had experience going to the state legislature and trying to persuade people to save the babies. And they came together in groups of people all along the East Coast in particular. And um, uh, as, uh, the more they got thinking about the um, uh, putting together a march, uh, they developed the rose as a symbol of the baby and it turned out uh, that the rose also is a symbol of short life and martyrdom. And uh, they put together uh, a group of people, about 30 or so, uh, and they wanted this march. And um, uh, so they didn't have a place to meet. And someone called me and said, we have this group of people and we're trying to put together a march and uh, we don't have a place to meet. Uh, can we meet in your house? And I said yes. And so I had about 30 more people in my house up the stairway, uh, sitting at tables, making all sorts of plans. I didn't do anything except serve drinks that night. <laughs> Light drinks, you understand. I wasn't in the planning made. I was just watching all of this. Seemed to me absolutely wonderful. They, they knew what they were doing. 
Uh, they worked, I think, that night until about three o'clock in the morning, put all the plans together, and they left. But it was a couple of days later, and I got a phone, a phone call saying, uh, we're trying to get a permit, uh, but in order to get a permit, we have to have an address in Washington. Can we use your address? <laughs> then they needed a telephone number. <laughs> Then they wanted to know, since I was in Washington, would I please go over and start asking their members of Congress to come to the march that they were planning. And I knew my way around Washington that much, and I said, yes, I'll make the phone calls. And so we had a list of members of Congress, and we're putting together a march. And by this time, I'm suddenly aware uh, we've got permits and everything, but we don't have a master of ceremonies. And so I started trying to find a master of ceremonies from the congressman and other people around. Nobody wanted to be interested in this marching around. And since I was the one who had the names and so forth, I became the master of ceremonies of the first March for Life. And now you know you got to be careful about whoever you let in your dining room. You don't. <laughs> I love all of those people, all of the work that they have done and what they have put together. So I'm not uh, the beginning of this. I just had a, a vacant room for a meeting, and it's turned out to be a wonderful experience meeting all of you in the snow and everything, too. But that brings us right back to so. So we had that first march, uh, and then uh, when we were, we had a uh, meeting afterwards about um, uh, what we're closing down the little bit of activity we had. We had, as I recall, it was something like we had $400 and we were uh, trying to find, we were meeting to close down the books and everything and uh, see to whom we'd give the $400. And, I remember one fellow saying, you know, Washington's not doing anything about this, uh, this tur overturning Roe v. Wade. I think we ought to have another march. And folks, now we've got number 37 coming up. And that's uh, how we get the uh, interest here, though. Of all those people marching, think about uh, when people say they, uh, they appreciate the work that we do here in Washington, but some of you understand, uh, what does it take to put together a bus, go get the money, get 50 people on a bus, it's uh, snowing outside, uh, you come to Washington, you find a place to drop the people off, they go marching, you lose all 50 of them. <laughs> then, you, then you try to find the bus and put them all back up together and take them back home. Now, think that that is done by people throughout the United States as far away, and they red eye it in from uh, Missouri and Iowa and so forth. So uh, that's how the March for Life operates, is obviously somebody has to go get the permit, and I do that. Uh, but the March for Life is everyone who comes uh, and marches. And last year, uh, because of these situations that I'm talking about and what we're going to do about them, uh, people were sufficiently concerned uh, that they came in the largest numbers that we've ever had, uh, which was the 300,000 that were here last year, and I'm sure that was promoted largely uh, because of the change of an administration. But for the March for Life then to start for the second March, then uh, we um, were definitely all no exception people. and. Um, we had to put together a corporation, and the print, we uh, set right then and there uh, that we would make certain that the March for Life would have a set of principles without any exception whatsoever. And so the most important thing that we ought to think about tonight is that set of principles and what are we going to do with them and get everybody educated and pulled together uh, to be um, upholding, not just saying, yeah, I'm for the life principles. This is a matter of accepting the life principles in both word and deed and sticking with it together in unity with these life principles. 
If we don't do that, we're going to be in the same mess of the situations that I've just described to you. You have to have principles set in stone that you understand, that you accept within yourself. You accept it by your mind, you accept it by your heart, and pull the group together on these principles. Now, the policy is to save all of the babies without any exception whatsoever. Now, the, um, I have materials that uh, were at the desk for you, and I'm going to be referring to them. So uh, if you didn't get them coming in, get a set going out. A copy of the annual report, and there are several items in here I'll be referring to. And I also have a sheet of three papers that I'll talk about now about uh, the life principles and the work that we have there. The life principles basically are very simple. There are seven of them. Uh, they come together in a pattern. The way they were drafted uh, was simply the regular, ordinary homicide law of every state um, in the United States. There's some set of homicide laws in your, your uh, statutes for the states. Basically, says don't kill people. And it uh, tells you uh, here, when, why. And if you do, you're going to have punishment. The important issues for your principles have to be who are you going to save? Who are you trying to save? It has to be everyone. In existence, at fertilization. And you must put the at fertilization on there because very shortly after we developed these principles, head of federal uh, agencies saying that life begins at implantation. That was the gimmick to be able to either use pills or something else or uh, make sure that um, the intentional killing would be there. So the first principle is a right to life endowed by our creator. Those, those principles are set in the words of the Declaration of Independence, by the way. Uh, an innocent human being in existence at fertilization with a right to life endowed by our creator. That's the first one to begin with, who. Um, the other is to assure that that right to life for each human being, not only the preborn children, but for everyone else also, uh, is there without regard to age, health, or condition of dependency. So that our right to life must indeed be protected uh, from the moment of fertilization throughout the natural continuum of life. And three or four uh, of those principles identify without regard to age, health, or condition of dependency. And then you come to two very important uh, principles. One of which is uh, addressed to the preborn child. After all, when, when Roe v. Wade came down, that was uh, 1973, and um, uh, quite obviously, uh, many of the techniques that we have today of deciding whether or not there's a pregnancy and so forth were not available uh, at, that, at uh, that time. So uh, that uh, this means that you must have a principle uh, which will protect the right to life from fertilization throughout the natural <laughs> continuum of life. When we put these together first, they were put together in um, the context of state homicide laws, basically which say, do not kill. And if you do, there's a penalty. Uh, the first draft that we had for the March for Life was set in exactly that uh, form, uh, do not kill. Uh, and it was suggested at our meeting, of these same 30 people, by the way, um, someone saying, this is so negative. We ought to put it in the positive, and therefore the life principles now are set in the positive of a duty to preserve and protect life. One important one is, if you don't know whether or not there is a human life there to protect, resolve your doubt in favor of saving a life. That also is right out of the 
uh, homicide laws in most of the states. It's a matter of, uh, here, a hunter, here's a rustle in a bush. Don't shoot into the bush thinking you may kill a rabbit when it could be your uh, hunting partner. So when in doubt, if you don't really know whether or not a human being is there, um, and that works very well with us, with the pills and so forth, if you don't know a human being is there, conduct yourself in a way to preserve life. And of course, uh, the important one is, if two or more human lives are endangered, then you have a duty to protect each and every one with equal care. That means you can't have an exception for the life of the mother or the life of the baby. And the reason this is so important of knowing about the equal care provision is that's an ordinary thing of talking to. It's also ordinary for the, uh, for the uh, medical profession uh, that if you uh, have two or more human beings, uh, then you would not in any, in any point uh, think it was right and proper to intentionally kill one to try to save the other. I give the example all the time that the equal care is something that is really very ordinary. Uh, say you have an automobile um, a collision and a pregnant mother's head goes through the windshield and it, there's not very much a doctor can do, but she is pregnant and there would be an effort to try to save her and also her preborn child. Now, it may turn out you can't save either one of them, that her head did go through the windshield, uh, and you can't save her. And it, also, you may not be able to save the baby because the baby may be so young and it doesn't have lung power and so forth to be able to save the baby, that you would have a situation where you may not ha be able to save both people, but you would, uh, the doctor would be asked to try to do so. Most important thing, however, at no time would you be saying, well, uh, one can't live, uh, uh, doesn't seem like one can live, they try to save another. So uh, the principle that we have here, you don't kill the mother to save the baby, you don't kill the baby to save the mother. We have a doctrine of equal care to try to save both the mother and the preborn child. Now, in building these um, principles, as I say, I began with just the principles of state homicide laws, um, and largely uh, because I, I must tell you, you know, I'm World War II vintage. Uh, I'm aware, of, was aware of the Nuremberg trials, and therefore, the principles uh, that uh, I was using from the uh, state homicide laws had to do with that whole issue of thou shalt not kill. But in addition, I was very much aware of the Nuremberg trials. And um, not that I was not at the Nuremberg trials, by the way, I was in college, but I kept reading about the Nuremberg trials at the time and I thought, Gee, my country is wonderful. My country didn't take the, these people who did terrible things who were our enemies, and we didn't uh, shoot them all. Rather, we set up a tribunal and set principles by which um, you, you could judge what was the kind of a crime that was being, whether or not there was a crime being committed uh, in Germany with um, uh, knowing now that uh, six million people were killed because they were in a group and um, knowing uh, that uh, there was a whole different rationale of operation that we could not subscribe to by the Nazi regime. Now, what is in the, um, the, these papers um, are the, the uh, basic uh, background for the life principles. One uh, that I've already said was the homicide laws, but in addition, the last sheet says, abortion is decriminalized, it can never be legal. That comes from the principles of the Nuremberg trials. They set up the, uh, here the provision 
that if you had a situation where uh, a class of people were identified and they were going to be killed, they were innocent people, um, that that was a crime against humanity to decide to kill all of these people uh, who were totally innocent. And so um, I took the, um, the principles right from uh, the, the um, Library of, Cong of Congress, a book on the um, Nuremberg trials, and I put the principles down so that you can see that that is um, consistent with our setting up the principles of uh, the um, uh, ho uh, regular homicide statutes. In addition, uh, after we had already agreed to the um, principles uh, for the March for Life, put them even in our documents, um, I was looking up some other work one day and uh, I think I was trying to find something, as I recall, something about Russia. I don't know why I was doing that, but it seems like that's where I was and I stumbled across this book. And I find an encyclical from 1930. The name is Costi Kanubi, Catholic marriage. They're in the, um, it's a very long encyclical on Catholic marriage. Um, as I say, December 1930, Pope Pius XI. And um, there are about three pages on thou shalt not kill. Uh, that's on the yellow sheet. And uh, the interesting thing is, now we have the principles drawn up by uh, the regular homicide statutes. Uh, that's consistent uh, also with the Nuremberg trial principles. And now I find for the Roman Catholic Church the same principles uh, set up. There is one addition in, uh, in Costi Canubi, which is St. Paul saying, uh, you may not do evil, that good may come of it, which is the addition uh, in the um, Casti Canubi uh, encyclical on thou shalt not kill. So these principles that we have set up for the March for Life have the backing now of three uh, credible sources, regular homicide law, Nuremberg trials uh, principles, uh, and also for the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the encyclical of Costi Canubi, all of which are no exception, no compromise, and no one may do evil, that good may come of it. Setting up those principles, most of the time when you sit and talk to somebody about the principles, everybody says, yeah, I agree with that, yeah, I agree with that, yeah, I agree with that, everything's, until, they come to a situation and they think, gee, if we put uh, no exception in there, we're not going to get any votes maybe out of the Congress. So we better compromise a little bit. And that has been the issue now for 36 years of these, um, uh, these compromises. And um, uh, when I come to a group such as this, where I know that all of us are very much already I, uh, no need to try to convince anybody that I know here about the importance of the life principles. The point is that this is what we have to go out and educate about. And that is the most important thing in the work that we still have to do is that exception clause. The exception clause is very, very bad for legislation. It's very, very bad in uh, any of the kind of a situation uh, where two or more lives are, are uh, uh, unfortunately are, are um, endangered uh, and we've got to take these principles totally to heart. Um, I brought all the background material with you so you will feel comfortable in reading what Costi Canubi says about it and so forth so that you can feel comfortable there. One of the other attacks that is on the life principles of no exception, no compromise, is the fact that many of the people still think that uh, they'll be able to get a law or uh, whatever it is that they're working on if they make a compromise of um, uh, trying to get a little something is better than nothing. Now that's not true. 
Sometimes a little something you got is worse than you didn't have it at all. Take even partial birth abortion, which everybody feels so uh, deeply concerned about because um, who can think about when a larger baby is being intentionally killed? But the point is that uh, all larger babies should be saved. All the preborn babies, there is no place for an exception clause to talk about uh, no abortions except. The answer is no abortions. The incremental approach is of trying to get a little something. And all of us want to get that little something. If we can say one baby, there isn't one person in here who wouldn't do what they could do to save one baby. One of the things is you can't compromise and, and, uh, for the intentional killing of other children. The other big thing that you're also hearing right now from the speeches of the president is, um, uh, and by the way, I have a, um, oh no, that's my one to Notre Dame. You know, you got more, uh, spinning out more papers than you can imagine. Um, is middle uh, uh, the middle ground. That is, uh, the pro-abortion people and the pro-life people and try to find some middle ground. Now you must have heard that uh, speech at Notre Dame. You heard that at least about 10 times. Uh, tell me, what is the middle ground? You kill a baby on this hand and you don't kill a baby on this one. Now, how is it, you know, do you come and get a half a baby or exactly what is this middle ground that you're working on? This is a yes or a no situation. Understand that uh, there is no such thing as um, trying to accommodate the abortionists into something that you can compromise with um, to save all of the babies. The answer still must be save all of the babies. The other thing that you heard at Notre Dame was we're going to reduce abortion. Well, if abortion is so bad that you want to reduce it, then why not get rid of it? The church has taken that position. The bishops have been very strong. Um, there is no middle ground, and we don't reduce abor uh, abortions until you reduce it to zero. Um, and stop. <laughs> now, how to proceed? Well, of course, one of the ways that we proceed is try to figure out what do we want to do with these principles. When you look at the principles, we do come out for a human life amendment, and that's what we felt in the early days, that we needed a human life amendment. Um, I have drafted that so that it, there is no exception in there. We've had it introduced. Congressman Dornan has introduced our human life amendment many, many times. Um, I am convinced now that it's not just a matter that it's difficult uh, to get a human life amendment through, uh, but it takes, and it takes more time. I am also convinced now that there is a way to do it by legislation, that rather than having a human life amendment, uh, we have a properly drafted human life bill uh, that will have no exceptions whatsoever. And I understand the climate is not really favorable for this right now on either the Hill or in, uh, by the president. But the most important thing is uh, we must get a start on drafting a human life bill and come together in unity on the life, bill, on the, um, life principles for a right and proper human life bill. Obviously, another important thing, you are coming to the March for Life, aren't you? I mean, <laughs> January 22, folks. Uh, how else do we proceed? We've got to do something with this media. Um, I think that um, me the media and the web uh, getting issues uh, out to the public 
is one of the most important things. We've got to get the word out on the life principles. We have to state it uh, firmly. We cannot be defensively about it. And we also have to be very professional and very straightforward. This is not a fighting issue in the, same, uh, in the way of calling somebody a nut or something like that. That's not where we're going. Uh, we're going to obviously uh, do the work on these life principles. Uh, educating and so forth by proceeding um, uh, on a professional ground of explaining what it is we're trying to do and how we're going to do it. Now, the reason is um, that we, again, how are we going to get some of this done? Um, I look at this president and I see um, a very attractive personality who is obviously um, being able to persuade many, many people, encourage many people uh, to his way of uh, doing whatever his project happens to be. Uh, but uh, we have the situation of people uh, still wanting to endorse uh, abortion literally endorse it and not have it um, uh, stopped. And when I said stopping abortion, I also want to call your attention in, in the book uh, to a Supreme Court decision with uh, uh, the name of which is Gonzalez. And that had to do with uh, the um, um, partial birth abortion saying that the bill itself was uh, was